I'm, I hope you're excited about this new series called Hot Sauce. And I'll, I'll tell you some of the inspiration from it. It's a lot, it comes from a lot of places. Uh, but I, I happened to go out to eat with a buddy of mine at work. He says, he's been begging me. I like to go eat by myself. I really do uh, at work. It gives me time to decompress and think and, and all that. I'm obligated to conversation sometimes. But uh, it's a nice break. But he, he, he begged me. He said, look, I'll pay for it. I'll pay. He, I mean, how are you going to turn that down? So we went to this restaurant, and uh, he ordered, and he gave me, uh, you know, some ideas what to order. But I'm one of those people that I like to eat what I'm going to eat. And the way they prepare it and bring it to the table is how I'm going to eat it, usually. I don't add a lot. I'm a ranch guy. Got any ranch guys in here? About ranch gals? Yeah, right, right. So uh, I'm one of those people, but uh, not when it comes so much to hot sauce. I like it better as I get older. But I'm a Cholula kind of guy, not too, not too hot and heavy. Uh, but this guy, he ordered his meal, and when he, uh, when the meal came, he he asked. He said, "I need to see your hot sauces." And they acted like they knew exactly what he was talking about. I didn't know you could do this, so she went in the back and she came back with this big brown tray of nothing but, but hot sauces. And I, I was a little, you know, I didn't know you could do that. And so she let him pick, and I looked at the name. She said, "This is uh, Devil's Blood." This is whatever, I don't know, man. She started coming with these crazy, crazy names. And he picked probably the second hottest one there was. He said, I'm not sure I'm in the mood for this one, Dave. I'll get this one. Got some devil's blood and put it all over his food. I said, and everybody's looking. I think everybody was like me, like, man, I know you can order or, you know, get that. And I, I said, you sure you can handle that? You need some bread or water or milk or whatever it is they give you to cool it down. I don't think there's anything that can cool it down sometimes. But anyway, um, he said, you know what? He said, the reason I do that he said I'm not about just because they put it in front of me I'm not just going to eat it I'm just not going to do that Um, it can be better I'm not just going to eat it the way they put it in front of me so I want it this this add spice to it I thought man there's some there's some uh truth in that right although I don't want any hot stuff and I want to tell you that uh as we get this thing started next weekend if you're a real man or real woman right and guys, if you want more hair on your chest, you want a deeper voice, next week we're going to be eating some hot wings. I'm not sure it's going to be on stage, but it might be immediately after for five minutes. And we're going to get the hottest stuff we can find. And there's gift cards to be won. I don't know to wear yet. I not picked it out. But we had a men's uh, retreat yesterday, and I proposed the idea just to get some feedback, and everybody's raising their hand. So it'll be immediately after this. And listen, it'll be, th- it'll be some uh, stipulations involved. Uh, it'll, it'll be a time limit. How many can you eat in five minutes? All right. And we'll pile the wings up, but they're going to be brushed and dipped and soaked in some type of uh, devil's blood. Uh, and we're going to see who can win these gift cards. And I got to be honest, I'm just looking for somebody to cry for their mommy or uh, pass out, throw up, anything. I'm, I'm just looking for that, really. But we'll, we'll reward you if you're interested in that. They, they made a sign up sheet this morning and it's right over there at the connections table so maybe you're joining a life group maybe you're signing up to get baptized that's where you do all that stuff but today it's where you sign up to eat some hot wings so uh we'll make it fun and and so it's it's not no joke though okay and i'm not in it i thought about i just thought this is wrong i might get beat up is i'll put some like barbecue sauce on mine and i'll sit on the end and and laugh at y'all and lick mine and rub it all over my face but uh, but I think this is a real deal. So if you're a real man or woman, uh, sign up today for that. Okay, but hot sauce, man, it changes things. It changes, man. And, and listen, there's so many people, when spiritually speaking, man, when we're walking through life following Jesus. A lot of times we, we just kind of go with the flow. We just kind of uh, settle for a mediocre walk. We, man, it's supposed to be a spicy thing, man. It's supposed to be some action and, and adventure and things like that. So you'll see there'll be a few ways that this this series kind of unfolds related to hot sauce, but mostly it's about faith like fire, okay? We're going to learn to have how to have more faith. And I'll tell you what I'm doing today. Man, I'm, I'm telling you, I was up here till 1230 last night, asked Brad, really struggling with what I'm talking about today. Um, I'm really going to try to expose culture. I I think we're just not aware of the impact that our culture has on us. And I believe if you are made aware, 
from the from scripture man it, you, there's a lot of adjustment that will happen there's a lot of life change there'll be an alertness about life and I want to I want you to leave here knowing that because what we know is God called us to be unique he called us to be different and not like anybody else not like anything else he he spent a lot of time on us creating us not to chase you know I want a house like they've got I want a car like they've got and so we spend so much effort and attention paying attention to what's going on around us we just kind of follow that we go with the flow which will get us in trouble but God didn't create us to be an imitation he didn't I always try to look for somebody that looks just like me and I can't find them they're just not quite as handsome or or whatever I can't find it um, and so I'm kidding I know I know my ugliness uh, but here's what the Bible says in first Peter chapter 2 <laughs> Somebody clap. <laughs> Amen. We love this verse around here in 1 Peter chapter 2. It says, But ye, I said ye, are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. Y'all are weird. You're weird. You're strange. All that loud music and that love for people and serving people and giving generously and living righteously. You're really really weird that's because I think our church kind of swims upstream I really do so why should we be weird why should we be different the Bible says it said that so that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light it's out of darkness and into light so being different being peculiar actually brings praise to God and we're going to look at how not to be normal because normal is just not working it just doesn't work and part of the problem with trying to be like everybody else you can't change what you imitate so we're called to be different and there's a better way to live life but there's something in the way and it is culture so I want to pray and uh, we're going to be in the book of Daniel today uh, let's pray Father God thank you for your uh, worship already Lord we're we're pumped up we're excited we're tuned in Lord I don't know about everybody else but I need you to move in my life I need purpose and direction I need clarity God I want to be um, um, I want to point people to you God but I need clarity so God, I pray for every person in this room Lord that's got some good news and bad news this week I pray for their decision making God and when we walk walk out of here today Lord we'll know more we'll have more clarity it's in Jesus name we pray Amen. Hand clap for your band. They're pretty hot. Oh, hot sauce. So we're going to be in Daniel today, and I believe that the book of Daniel does a, a really good job to kind of show us uh, how to lead, lead lives in, a, in kind of a godless culture. I mean, it just really is. It's been moving that way quickly for a long time. I don't mean to sound negative or anything like that, but it just is, and it's no secret in scripture that it would move that way and as a matter of fact that um, where we're reading today is 7th century BC okay uh, long long thousands and thousands of years ago but what we're going to find out is 7th BC looks a whole lot like 21st century AD all right it's, it looks just like it so and if you if you don't know there's a, a current there's a specific movement a current to culture uh, and it doesn't move you, if you just go with the flow, it doesn't move you towards more love for God. That current, that movement doesn't move you into more obedience. It actually does the opposite. It takes you further away. We're not more God-loving. We're not more righteous or holy. We're less because of this, this current that will take you further away. Matter of fact, you know, I, I was a really good picture. I know most of y'all have done this. I still feel like I'm 12 years old when I go to the beach. I'm doing all the, the things that, that stupid little boys do. Uh, I like to go out pretty deep. I'm, I'm starting to think about it a little bit more, you know, because we always seem to go right after short week. Um, but I like to go out there. I like to see what's going on and let the waves knock me out. And you go straight out. You know, your, your family and friends are lined up here on the beach, and you go out. And so you, if you're not paying attention, that current just kind of pulls you slowly and more slowly put, pulls you down. Uh, and when you look up, you're like, man, you, you get kind of disoriented. You lose your perspective a little bit. And I, I literally thought one time, dang, Holly left me. 
I bet her plan is to get me out in the ocean and she's going to pick up and leave, right? And so she tends to uh, uh, sit still, though. She doesn't uh, move at all, but it's me that's floating down. And before you know it, it's 100 yards uh, down the beach. You've got to kind of realize where you are and move back and get back in front of her, right? So Because I like for her to watch me, and I know she's not. She's got sunglasses on, and I'm... Baby. <laughs> And she's just sitting there looking at me, so I know. She just puts those sunglasses on make me think she's watching me. But this current, it, it pulls us, and it pulls us away from God. And if you just go with the flow, at some point you'll look up and say, man, I'm way off the mark. I'm way, I'm, I'm further away than I'm meant to be, okay? So how do we live this, this, this life uh, successfully uh, with this culture that just pulls us, there's this pulling to it? And Daniel's going to show us. We're going to be in Daniel chapter 1. And I'm going to get us started. You're going to feel this. Okay, here we go. Here we go. So we're going to start with verse 1. It says, In the third year of reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. That means attacked it. Okay? So we're going to attack God's people here. And they did. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, uh, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. So they started raiding the things that were meant for God, okay? They, this was w- meant for worship for God. Um, then he carried it off to the temple in, uh, of his God in Babylonia, which is anti-God, and put the treasure house of his God. Put it in the treasure of the house of his God. Now, this is probably the greatest abomination to God's people is that, man, this is meant for God, and now it's used to serve other gods. It's dedicated, it was consecrated, it was separated for God, but here, now they're using it to worship a false god. Verse 3 says, Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, king, uh, chief of the court officials, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and nobility. We're going to get to some of these uh, young, young guys, these young studs. It says, young men without any physical defect, handsome. Now, I've got to imagine they were much like myself. Showing, right, honey? Right? <laughs> Showing aptitude for every kind of learning. They were sharp, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. So what they're saying is, I'm going I'm to teach you what to say. And I'm going to change the narrative to your life. I'm going to change the, just the way you live life and look at life and react to life. Verse 5 says, The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine. They had a special diet. And wine from the king's table because that's what society, that's what culture wants to do. It wants to set you, set itself up to be your source. It says, I'm going to feed you. I'm going to nourish you. Uh, they were to be trained for three years. This was a three-year process to really take out everything that was there before and put in something totally new. It was, in, it was strategic and on purpose. It said they would be trained for three years, and after that, they were to enter the king's service. So in verse 6, we meet our four guys, these awesome guys. So here it goes. Daniel uh, chapter 1 verse 6 says, Among those who were chosen were some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Now, there's no doubt that culture is crazy. I mean, we don't even have to be a Christian to know. uh, But how, and I'm not really here to call it, say, just convince you how crazy it is. My goal today is to say, man, it is crazy. There is a pull. There is a current. But how do we live life knowing that as followers? So, um, you know what? I've got to get some glasses. I'm up here in denial right now. I'm making faces. I can't see. And I'm only 29. How did my vision get this bad? God. You know, it's easy to say, you know, it must have been a whole lot easier back then, you know, uh, to serve God in those days, you know. They don't have the problems that we have now. But when we read the book of Daniel, we realize that they face the same struggles that we face. 
uh, especially with the account we're reading today, uh, that, that the culture tries to seduce us into apathy, man. Apathy, it's killing Christians everywhere. Um, but what I love about this is it's going to teach us, you know, how to swim against the current, how to uh, go against the flow, stand for God, and all of that. And I want to show you uh, in chapter 1 here, the first point I want to, want to make is culture will define you. That's its goal. It will define you. It, it will, you know, try to describe and define you and label you and tell you who you are and, and what your life should look like. It's going to try and work. If you think about that, throughout life, man, we're constantly handed labels about us, uh, whether it's a, a diagnosis, a socioeconomic status, you know, you're married. I mean, your identity is all over the place throughout your life. And sometimes that's sometimes how we live, and culture wants to tell you who you are. This is who you are. This is what you should say. This is how you, you should act. These are the words that should come out of your mouth. Okay. Uh, in verse 7, the chief official gave them new names. New names. It's their first order of business was to pass out new names to Daniel. The name Belteshazzar to Haniah, Shadrach to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. So as soon as they got dropped off in Babylon, as soon as they went to get them, say, get these guys, we're going to train them up. And, and, and the first thing we're going to do is give them a new name. We're going to start calling them something else. Um, because the names that they had were unacceptable. The way you're living life right now is unacceptable. Because every one of their names pointed to their relationship with God. That's what their names meant. When we tease that out, we're going to see that their names were reminders to them and to others that they had a relationship with God, but the, the, the system, the culture said, we've got to get you a new identity. We're going to work hard at pulling that out and giving you a new one. And I know this is, seems like pretty ancient history uh, going so far back, but here, here's something I think will convince you. John, the author of Revelation here, when he chose, now, he's, he, read the book of Revelation. It's talking about the last days, which I'm convinced we are in the last days, Okay. But when he started talking about it in Scripture, and he had to decide an era in the Bible, what's a, you know, about all the Bible, what's an era that I can, I'm over here in Revelation, uh, I'm writing this, I'm going to point back to, and where he points back to is exactly where we are. He's talking about Babylon, okay? So that should be pretty compelling for you to say, hey, John's telling us about what it's going to look like in these last days, and he's using Babylon, Babylonia, to point to that. So this makes this reasonable to look at. It makes it realistic to do that. And so that's the one book he referred to. So they're going to try to change their identity. And listen, culture is going to try to change what we're called and who we're called. And it's, attack. it's an attack on our identity. Now, we know this. Here's where it picks up. So we know this. We know people try to rename things and people. We know culture works real hard to do that, right? They try to define it differently. And I know you've seen it. You, you know this. So I asked my AV team to kind of put up a few things, and I'll just follow your lead on this. Okay, these aren't French fries. These are potato sticks, okay? So somebody thought it's a good idea that I come along and give French fries. We already got a name for them, potato sticks. All right? What's the next? I don't know. Okay, these aren't gloves. Now, you might call, know them as gloves. But somebody try to come along and create a new name for it. Finger pants? No thanks. Nah. What's next? Okay. So, not tissue paper. Sneeze paper. That's pretty, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not calling it that. I already got a name for that. Let's see. What's next? Okay, not donuts. <laughs> Somebody got really creative here. Sugar bagels. Sugar bagel. That sounds a little more. No, not really. I'm sticking with donuts. What's next? Is there another one? Okay, cat puppies. Come on, man. Somebody said, you know, I don't like the name that they've been given, so I'm going to come along and change it to cat puppies. What's next? 
Whoa, 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 whoa. Now you mess with my milk. Everybody knows me, milk. We're not calling it cereal water. It just sounds, that sounds like uh, skim milk, doesn't it? Maybe skim milk, cereal water. Is there another one? <sighs> How dare somebody? There's already a name for bread. It's called bread. Not raw toast. Is there another one? Oh, okay. That's pretty sharp. Not an aquarium, because that sounds too formal. We're going to call it a fish museum. Nope. Is there another one? Okay. <laughs> Let's skip that one. Is there another one? Is that it? Please let that be it. Oh, yes. Okay, good. So who thought that, man, I can just pop up and create a new name for something. And these, these, these people did. Culture tries to label you. They're trying real hard. Every, it seems like every couple of months there's a new name for what you're going through or what you're dealing with or what it is. And they work real hard to do that. So Daniel, let's look at a few of these names and I want you to see how hard culture uh, pulls and moves and tries to shift us from that. Daniel. Daniel literally means God is my, ju- is my judge. This is an acknowledgement Assuming that God is the creator, and we're his people, we're the the sheep in his flock, Uh, we didn't do anything to earn life, anything like that, life was given to us as as a gift, and that, listen, here's the deal, if you create something, you should have the right to name it, right? That gives you, the so you've been created, I've been created, we've been given life, and so we already have a label. We already have an identity when we know God. And I want to tell you, we're going to stand in front of the giver of life and get a, give an account of how we lived our life. I'm Mr. Positive, Mr. Encouraging, and this, but there's also truth, is that how we live our life matters. It matters. So I wanted to get this point. Is it matters to the giver how you treat the gift? It matters. Now, most of us know this concept. I had two girls. I have two girls, not just had. Are you leaving, Dad? Two girls. They're, they're getting older now. They played with American Girl dolls. American Girl. I don't, I'm, I don't remember how much they cost. I think it was hidden from me how much they cost. But I knew that they must have been pretty valuable because they wanted them. You know what I'm saying? So, but what I would find sometimes is they'd set up tea parties out in the yard with the little, the little dolls and have them in a circle. And they'd forget about it, and they'd go in the house, maybe get something to eat, use the bathroom, forget they're out there, and then it's raining on them. You know what I'm talking about? So I remember saying something to them like, hey, man, I worked real hard for those American Girl dolls, and I don't even play with them. <laughs> but, so, but it mattered. I was like, man, I, 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 I worked. I spent the money on it. I probably went and got it. Um, but I know that it mattered how they treated the gift. And we get kind of irritated at that sometimes, that, that when you give a gift, right, it matters how you treat the gift. Y'all know what I mean. But the one who gives life has the right to judge it. Okay? Gave you your life. So if they are the creator, they invented you, they have the right to judge your life. And to, and, and, and to speak to what to do with the life that you've been given. Okay? The Bible says in Hebrews 9, it won't be on your screen, once to die, then judgment. What that means is every single one of us will have to, every single one of us will have to stand before Almighty God and give an account for our life. We've got to be prepared for that moment that, we, that we're going to answer. And the problem is, that this doesn't fit the narrative of the system of culture. The system doesn't want us to be submitted to God. It doesn't want us to be answerable to God. The system wants you to to be submitted to culture. But write this down. I don't know how cool of a tattoo this would be. 
But God has a right to say how I live my life. Because he invented your life. He invented my life. Because what's right is right, and what's wrong is wrong. He gets to decide what that is, and there's judgment attached to it. It's just the reality. I wouldn't love you if I didn't tell you that that day's coming. We're so busy with life. You know, I heard Kieran, she did great with announcements, to say, you know, I know you're busy with life, and we are. Sometimes we're kept so busy that we, we, we can only think about this week, this month. You know, it's a lot to handle. You know, we're not thinking eternity, man, and that day is coming. And listen, truth is not relative. There is a right. There is a wrong. And God gets to decide what that is. Okay? So instead of Daniel being God is my judge, they changed it. They changed it. And here's the new name. Belteshazzar. Meaning, Lady Protect the King. Now, Beltes was the name of this Babylonian goddess. Not anything connected to following Jesus or Christianity as we know it. Uh, and this name, they changed it. It was a cry for Beltes to protect the king. And notice there's still, a, there's still a, a, a request to divinity. There's still a request to a type of God, um, but only to ask God for things. That's what that name, this is kind of deep. Some of y'all have to really, really listen. And what, it's, what this gives way to is, you just don't give your life to a, in submission to God. I don't want to have to answer to God. I don't want God to be my judge. And with this name, that is the new name, is no longer my serving God, but God serving me. I only connect with God, communicate with God when it's something to protect me, provide for me. Okay. And here's the movement. And this is what culture will do. It'll pull you, and it'll pull you from being. This is how you know that 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 you're in the current. Of culture. This is how you know there's a pool. Like when I looked up and see Hollywood's way down here, this is why I realized there's a current. Is it'll pull you and it'll move you from being submitted to God to being selective towards God. What that means is when I start looking at what God tells me, I move saying, God, well, if you say it, I'm going to do it. You said it in your word. You said it to me. I'm going to be obedient to that. So, uh, I don't know if I like that part of you, God. I don't know if I like that part of the Bible. I want him to protect me. I don't want him to judge me. I don't want anybody to tell me that the way I'm living my life is wrong. I just want to be able to do what I want to do, but I still want God to bless me. But I want to get to pick and choose what God gets to speak into my life. This is heavy. I told you, man. I lost a lot of sleep. That we move. That's when culture gets up. So if you're saying, man, I'm kind of like that. I'm, I, when I read God's word, I, I don't care for that. I like that. That's pretty good. I'll submit to that. But we be, start to become selective on what God says about our life. It's nice and quiet in here. It means I'm doing right. But when you start to look at Scripture, you say, I'm going to ignore that part. You know, I'm going to excuse it away. You know, they just, they just didn't know back then what we know now. And God hasn't learned what we've learned. So I'm not so sure that's got a lot of credibility to it. And culture, will, it'll convince us that that's the appropriate approach to God. That that's somehow acceptable. Here's the next name. Hananiah means Yahweh has been gracious. It, that name, it points to who God is. It's an awesome God-centered name. It focuses on the goodness of God, the grace of God, and just how merciful he is. But his name was changed to Shadrach. And Shadrach takes on a different meaning. It means commanded by a coup, which is another Babylonian god. We're going to kind of, we're going to kind of, it's still a, a deity of some kind. Okay. We're going to change your perception here. So no longer is his name about God's grace. You can feel the, the pull of culture here. Now it's about this thing, it said commanded by a coup, this thing that is forced on us. It's forced on us. Um, 
So the movement says, you know, used to get to serve God and now I got to serve God. It moves that, it shifts. It's, you know when you first found out, you man, man, God loves me and he's so grace and so, so full of mercy. And then as time passes, culture kind of shifts. It, it creates a current. And then you get to be, I see this all the time. People don't realize how much current, uh, the current, how strong the current is in culture. And then you see them later like, man, I remember them. When they had this view of God, it was so awesome. And now they let culture kind of change that out. And now all of a sudden they, it's work, man. I feel like I got to do for God. I feel guilty, man, if I'm not doing this. And you move from, listen, you move from bless, blessing to burden. So if you're assessing yourself, saying, where am I, man? I'm looking up for Holly on the beach. Way down there, I've shifted, man. It used to be a blessing to me, now it's a burden. That's a sign that, listen, culture has created a shift in your life. Now, when that's happened, when you shift from blessing to burden, man, then it, then it feels like a bunch of rules. Then it feels like, you know, something that binds you. And that's how you know. You kind of assess to say, man, culture's gotten a hold of me there. Okay. If you hear culture, it starts to refer to people of faith and the things of God, and suddenly it's not a good thing. I can feel that when I go out, right? In, in, in old days, it's like even if people didn't believe, like I don't necessarily, I don't believe in God or I didn't give my life to Jesus and all that, that's good that you do. I see the good in it. I see that people change and they're better people because of that. You know, they can recognize that. That's not the case anymore. When, when you present a relationship with God, the opportunity for that, and what God did, what starts to happen is, all of a sudden people look at that as restriction, and inviting them into rules. And it's a pretty good indication, man, of how, how much uh, the, the current of culture has, has moved us. So the moment you start to feel like worshiping God, and, and coming to church, and seeking Him, and giving, and serving, and then it moves to, this feels like work. That means that culture's done its job. It shifts your perspective. The third guy's Mishael, and his name means who is like God. Who is like God? And that's a good thing. That's a, his, his name that reflects his relationship with God. And what he's saying is God is amazing. It was, it, was a, it was a rhetorical question. It's a rhetorical question. It doesn't mean like, I don't know who God is, tell me. He's saying, who is, you know, who is like God? There is none like him. He's amazing. He's so awesome. It's a declaration of confidence. I am so confident because there is none like God. Who is? I'm so confident in that. But then there's a name change. So we're going to get that out of him. That confidence that comes with God is number one and he, he, you know, he's, he's so awesome. And they changed his name to Meshach, which means who is like a coup. So they moved a statement of confidence about God from his name, from his identity. They took that out. Their culture took that out. And if you let it, culture will move you from having confidence to being a coward. Culture does that to you. And I know you know what I'm talking about because I experienced it too. People say, look, it's okay if you believe. That's cool. That's cool. That's your thing. But just don't say it publicly. Don't say it out loud. Don't be so forward with it. Don't be so, you know, open about it. And the problem with that, God didn't call us to be cowards. He called us to be conquerors. Right? He called us to have courage. This happens to some politicians, you know, they might, they, some principle they express, you know, about, and you know, I'm not the political guy, everybody knows me. But I am a Christ follower. When I see somebody that, that mentions a principle of Scripture, and they mention it, all of a sudden they're not, they get attacked, and they're not fit for that office, okay? And so we're not supposed to vocalize our faith. And when you find yourself shrinking back, I'm not doing as much, you know, I'm, you know instead of standing up for what God, had, what God says and what righteousness is and holiness, you start to kind of, Seat back, you know, I'm not going to be too vocal about this. That's when you know that culture is having its effect. It's having its way. 
Here's the last name. We'll get going. Azariah means Yahweh has helped. It's giving credit to God, man. It's, it's, it's giving this um, intimate name of God in, in, the, in that Yahweh is the intimate name that Moses was given. Okay? It's an intimate same God. It's, it's an intimate relationship. Uh, not the description of God. Because the Hebrew word for El means God. So it's not like God, okay, God. And anything that with El in it, like Daniel, Mishael, that means there's God's involved. That's what that means. That El on the end means God. Now, Azariah is referring, her, his name refers to uh, an intimate God. God helps me. I have a relationship with God. So what they had to get real busy in changing the name here, that intimate name. You have it. We got to get rid of that. And his name was changed to Abednego, which means servant. Depending on what scripture you read, slave, slave to Nebo. Nebo's another Babylonian god. We got to change this. You're too connected to God, and, and culture wants us to change the way we perceive that you perceive your relationship with God. So there's no longer intimacy with this new name. It doesn't reflect any intimacy at all. All of a sudden, God is a taskmaster. Watch out. When you get to the point where it's no longer an intimate relationship with God, but now it feels like a task. It feels like a command. It feels like a whole list of things to do. Culture, again, has done its job. And here's the deal. If we're going to move from darkness to light and and help people along the way and go against the flow. We have to have our identity settled. There's people constantly trying to, culture's constantly trying to tell you, this is what you are. And it's different from what your relationship with God is, the identity that God gave you. And while we're at it, with that new identity, here's how you act, here's how you live your life. So God is the only one with the right to name you. God is the only one who has the right to give you your identity. I swear, if somebody came in and went out, I had my girls and said, we're going to name this one Rebecca. We're going to name this one Rachel. And they come in and say, no, nah, nah, we're going to name it something else. You crazy. I'd fight you over that, right? So culture is literally doing that. No. We've got a new identity. Not the one that God gave you. We're going to work really hard to get that out of you. And I love how Daniel refused to be named. I caught this little detail. I love little details of the Bible. And this is what it says in verse 4, uh, chapter 4, verse 8. They tried, to, they tried to give him this new name, and it just wasn't sticking. There's a little, you know, some resistance there. And this is what it says. At last, and this is the king talking, at last Daniel came in before me. Called him Daniel. They had already changed his name. This is three chapters later, man. At last Daniel came in before me, and he who was named Belteshazzar uh, after the name of my God. And you got to get to the place in your life, listen, where when the world tries to call you something, give you a new identity, that it doesn't stick. we got to pay attention. Listen, I'm going to blame Christians on this, Christ followers. The reason some people struggle with their identity in life is because we do a poor, I about said pee poor. We do a poor job of, of telling them what God's identity is for them. We do. We fail. And so we got to get better. If you're trying to, I mean, what's my next step as far as, man, I'm trying to really affect people's lives. You need to tell them what God thinks of them. Right? He says we're a masterpiece. We're not mass-produced. You can't mass produce a masterpiece. God took a lot of work on you. He gets to decide who you are and how you live your life. Right? And we got to do a better job of telling people what their identity is because not this world will convince them that it's something else. Convince them. So the first thing was culture will define you. Number two is culture will defile you. Defile you. First one's an attack on your identity. The second one's an attack on your integrity. See, the system, which is our, our, our culture, wants to discredit people 
who go against the flow, people who, who want to declare the gospel. They want, to, they want to discredit us. They want to discredit you. And one of the best ways for them to do that is to undermine your integrity. They want to call you out. They're looking hard. You're under a microscope, and I am too. Uh, they want to, because that's one of the quickest way to kind of deflate us is to discredit us. As a matter of fact, in the Bible, they tried this on Jesus. This blind guy was in the Bible. Jesus healed him of his blindness. And they kept telling them, this, this guy, this blind guy, they kept saying, you know, look, this man Jesus is a sinner. Don't you know that? And he said, you know, I don't know anything about that. All I know is I woke up this morning, I was blind, and now when I encounter him, I can see. So put that in your biscuit and eat it. They, they worked really hard to try to get to discredit Jesus himself constantly. His integrity was, was under attack. They kept calling him sinner and and, and, and he ate with sinners, and he was a drunkard, and all those things. And so, if it's going to happen to Jesus, it's going to happen to his followers. Okay, They're going to try to discredit us, and that's a, a pretty, uh, pretty sharp way to do that. Um, because if we talk like them, and we walk like them, and we look like them, we're not any different. We don't impact their lives. So there is a high, higher standard of living. And a lot of for y'all, that's going to cancel you out. You're saying, man, I, I feel better. I feel more comfortable when I'm just doing what everybody else is doing. And that is actually not following Jesus. He says the following means to do what I'm doing. Go where I go. The culture's gotten pretty good at, at attacking our integrity. Because God says, he says, you know, be holy because I am holy. We're called to holiness. Not showing up to church on Sunday. Not just getting in a life group, not just giving and serving, but to be holy. And you're going to feel that, that pull around here more often. There's going to be a lot of people are, are submitting themselves to accountability around here. They're saying, hey, can you talk with me once every couple of weeks to see where I'm at and hold me accountable? What they mean is, listen, God's called me to a higher standard. He's called me to holiness. To holiness. And God says, I want you to be holy because I am holy. And we reflect that with our life. So check out what Daniel did in in, in verse 8. It says, but Daniel resolved. That means he made a decision. He made a commitment. He drew a line in the sand that I'm not going to defile myself. I'm not going to do it. Not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. Because they set the best food in front of him that, that, that Babylon had to offer. But it violated the rules that, uh, that violated the law uh, that they couldn't eat those things. Okay, And he asked the chief official for permission. I love that. Asked for permission not to defile himself in that way. He's like, look, I need your permission. I really can't because I'm trying to I made a decision to do exactly what God's going to do, told me to do. I'm going to do it his way. And please, I need not to eat that. And I love that he asked for permission. Because he had conviction and courtesy. Conviction and courtesy at the same time. Holiness, holiness does not mean nastiness. You can be holy and humble at the same time. Listen, we're encouraged to think a certain way in this culture. And if you don't, you, are, you open yourself up to attack. You open yourself up to judgment, man. You're just trying to, right? But listen, you can have conviction, but you can also have courtesy. There is nothing worse and more embarrassing than Christians that try to act, try to shape other people's lives in such a rude way. That's got to stop. I'd love for that to start with our church that, man, we have conviction, but we don't have to be. I'm going through all my words. It's a faux cuss word, but I'm not coming up with anything but cuss words. <laughs> Listen, we don't have to be rude. When somebody, when, when there's a conviction that you have, you do not have to be rude. You're never called to rudeness, ever, never. You don't have to hurt people's feelings to, to, to act like you've got some kind of conviction, okay? So you can be holy, you can be humble at the same time. As a matter of fact, I think that's the only way to be holy is if you are humble, all right? So watch how you deal with people, with your convictions. I'm not saying your convictions are wrong. They're probably fine, but never be rude. Or don't tell people you come to this church. You know what I'm saying? 
He says, I can't defile myself in this way. I got a conviction, but I'm asking you permission. There's a way. Can we work through this? He, was, he asked for permission. Verse 10, the official had a problem, though. Verse 10. But the official told Daniel, I'm afraid of my lord, the king, who has assigned your food and drink. Why, uh, why should he see you looking worse than the other young men your age? The king would have my head because of you. He's saying, look, if I let you do it your way, man, if I, if I kind of step aside here, and you're going to get weaker and weaker, okay? If you, do, if you do this thing God's way, you're going to get weaker and weaker. And everybody who is eating the good food, they're going to get stronger and stronger. It's going to become more apparent that you're not eating like you're supposed to. And I'm going to get in trouble because of it. I'm going to bring it from the king because he's going to want to see what, you know, this is one of his little projects here. How's, how's that uh, uh, Daniel guy doing? How's he doing? He said, if you get in front of him and you look sick and weak and look like a stick, he's going to cut my head off. But he asked him for permission. And this is what Daniel said. Daniel then said to the guard, please test your servant for 10 days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. Here's what he was saying. Test us. Let, let us do it God's way. Let us submit to God the judge. Let, let me allow to, you know, I've got a conviction to do it God's way. So just give us 10 days. And then, you know, we're done. Compares to those other people that's been eating like y'all said they should. But we just don't want to bow down to this. Verse 13 says, it says just everything I just said. Compare our appearance with that of the young men who eat the royal food and then treat your servants in accordance with what you see. Look, give me a chance. So, 14 says, so he agreed to this and tested them for 10 days. You need to understand that every day that you live in Babylon, okay, I'm sorry, that you live in our culture, That we're going to be tested. It's a test every single time. Um, and the test is, are you going to buckle under the pressure of the culture? Every single day, are you going to buckle under the pressure? Are you just going to go with the flow like everybody else? Everybody else is doing it. You know, it's just not that big a deal. I know what the Bible says. But is that really what God meant? And that's one of the first questions that was asked in the Bible back in the garden is, did God really mean that? Did he really mean it? Or is it just a piece of fruit? So listen to this. We become culture's captives the moment we compromise our convictions. We become captive. That current just carries us, man. It's, it's a little steps at a time of compromise. It's usually nothing super big. It's a lot of little things, right? So you can be in the culture but not captive to the culture. We don't have to be captive to it. But Daniel and his friends says, we're not going to bow. We're not going to bow. And this food was just the first test. We'll find out, you'll find out later as you read that they were asked to bow down to even more. But make no mistake about it, your, your faith's going to be tested every single day. And so... I wanted you to understand just how much that, that we are in our test because I feel like we're, you know, you ever showed up to class? I didn't know we had a test. You know what I'm talking about? I'm the king of that probably. It's like somebody's getting their stuff out. I'm like, what are you doing? We got a test. I didn't know it was a test. I'm, I probably wouldn't have studied, but I didn't know there was a test. All right? Don't look at the person next to you, your little kid. That... So the number 10 in Scripture always represents the concept of being tested. So I want to show that to you, just to show you that there's a test. There's, there's a test. So 10 equals test. Listen, first, there's a, these are in no particular order, right? But 10 plagues of Egypt, right? That was the test Pharaoh. He, he had failed the test, and his heart was hardened. There's a test. 10 commandments. There were 10 commandments that were given to Moses on Mount Sinai, and it was to test God's there's always a test. And throughout scriptures, we, we see the concept of the tithe. It means 10, 10%. 10%. Not 11, not 7, 
10. The Lord says, give a tithe. 10. Malachi says this. It's a test. It's a test. He says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. That means here. means church. And test me in this, says the Lord. If I will not open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that you cannot contain. But it's a test. How you doing? In the New Testament, Jesus told a parable. He healed ten lepers. Okay, they left. And the test was, will you return? Will you turn around and come back and worship me? And one came back and nine kept going. It's a test. The one who came back was also a picture of the tithe that, that's returned to the Lord as an act of praise and worship. Okay. Ten servants given ten coins, and they were given a test on how they managed what they were given. It's a test. It's a test. And some of you don't even know that you've got a test today. All right. Then there were ten virgins, and there's more, but ten virgins in Matthew 25, and five of them were wise and Five of them were foolish, and when the bridegroom came, they were tested on whether or not they had prepared for his coming. So 10 is a test. You've got to understand that you're in a test. And listen, are you either going to go with the flow? If you're going to go with the flow, you've got to realize that we're in a test. So faithfulness is always tested in small things. Always tested in small things. It's easy to be, I'm going to be obedient in this big old thing that matters, but when it's daily, are you cutting corners? Are you being obedient? Are you, you know, you're being tested in the small things? And this is what he said. You know, he, uh, Daniel was convicted here, and he said, you know, God called me not to eat certain things and to eat certain things. And I'm sure the guy, the chief guy said, look, man, you really want to eat kale the whole time you're in here? How about some Taco Bell? We got Taco Bell here, you know. But it was the small things he's being tested. And Jesus said it like this. Luke 16, 10 says, if you're faithful with the little things, you will be faithful in the large ones. He bases on what he's wanting to give you and do in your life based on how you handle what you already have. But, big but. But if you are dishonest in the little things, you won't be honest with the greater responsibilities. I can't give you more because you can't handle it. You can't handle a little bit I gave you, and you're asking for more and want more. It's the little things when we're faithful. So to go against the flow, you've got to know what you believe. You've got to be aware. You've got to know what you believe. So you've got to know who you are and know what you believe. And if you let it, culture is going to define you and culture is going to defile you. But in the middle of all that, and here's the last point, God will defend you. If you let him, he'll defend you. If you have courage and stand on your conviction, you've got the guts to kind of swim upstream and go against the flow and not be a copycat of what everybody else is doing. There's blessing that follows that. There's blessing. Verse 18 says, at the end of the, of the time, set by the king to bring them into his service, the chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. Verse 19, the king talked with them and found none equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the king's service. And it's like they're saying, I don't know what it is, but these guys are different. They're, they're the other ones are good, but these four right here, nobody is like them. Nobody's like them. And people want e e extraordinary blessing, but they don't want to live extraordinary lives. There's a disconnect with that. Verse 20 goes on to say, In every matter of wisdom and understanding about the king questioned them, he found them, listen, ten times better than all the others. Okay? Magicians, enchanters, and in the whole kingdom. So, Remember, I'm committing, I'm going to do this thing God's way. And when they chose to do it God's way, and they thought, man, this doesn't make any sense for you to do it God's way because you're going to be weaker and, and, and I'm going to get in trouble because of you trying to be obedient. Uh, and he said, just test us, man. Just give us the test. 
We feel like if we commit to God, he's going to give us his best. And they did that, and here's what happens. The Bible says there were none equal. And it just now read, as a matter of fact, ten times better. You know why? Because they did it God's way. So write this down. God's way is better. God's way is better. Some of y'all are working so hard to try to fit in. You're trying to get affirmation from every other source out there. And I'm telling you, if you'll serve God and honor God and commit to God, God is going to bless your life. If you do it God's way, he's going to bless your life. I know it doesn't, it doesn't sound like because it doesn't make sense. Man, I, it sounds so foreign like it's going to work backwards against me if I do it God's way. Listen, God's way is better. Here's what you find out. The blessing of God is always better than the blessing of men. Every single time it's better. As a matter of fact, it's ten times better, the Bible says, doing it. Maybe you haven't done it God's way yet. Like This is what, what the Bible says about how I live my life overall and all the areas in between. And sometimes like, man, I can't commit to that. I feel like I'm going to miss out. I'm going to lose. Because that's what culture tells us. Culture will tell us, man, you, if you do it God's way, you're going to end up with less. You're going to end up broke. You're going to end up poor, unsatisfied, alone. But that's not what the Bible says. We've got a choice. We've got a decision. We do it God's way. It says it's ten times better. So I started thinking about this, you know, because culture promises less joy. If you do that God thing, man, you can be able to live life. It's going to be a boring life. You're going to miss out on things. Less joy, less fulfillment, whatever. So I started outlining a couple ways that I went back. I've talked about these stats before, right? So cover your kids' ears if they're in here. They should be in rear of kids anyway. Sexuality. Man, if I do sexuality God's way, the way it's outlined in Scripture, I feel like it's going to be boring. But all the non-Christian studies say that people who do it God's way, the way it's outlined in Scripture, have more fulfilling sex lives if they do it God's way. Culture says if you do money God's way, you're going to be broke. I mean, who can can afford to give before you do anything else? That 10% rich is the, or God is the make or break me. But what I read was that tithers at every income level, no matter what you are, your your counterparts there, people make the same amount of money of you as you do. Those that tithe have more. How is that even possible? Doesn't make sense. If I do it God's way, it sounds like less to me. But we see in this example in Scripture is ten times better doing God's way. How is that? It goes back to the last point. The blessing of God is always better than the blessing of man. I'm just telling you, if you submit your life to God and say, God, I want your hand on my life. I want your hand on my family. I want your hand on my, my marriage. I'm telling you, God's way is better. Last little bit of scripture here. Jeremiah 6, 16. This is what the Lord says. So what this is saying is, listen up, because God's talking. God's talking here. Stop at the crossroads. It's saying you've got a decision to make. There's a, there's a fork in the road. You've got a decision to make. This may be, be the best opportunity why it's fresh on your mind to commit one way or another. One way or another. You've got a decision to make. You're at a crossroads. And look around. That means look at your situation. Take an assessment of what it looks like and what we've just heard, the situation you're in. Ask for the old godly way and walk in it. Take that. Take that path is what God is saying. Look at the old godly way. And what that means is, what does God's word say about your situation? How does it line up? How do you get back over in front of Holly so you can wave at her? How do you, that that's what we do, that that's what we do. Ask for the old godly way. 
and walk in it. Take those steps. You're at the crossroads, take the right road, the one that matches up with God's word. Travel its path, and you will find rest for your souls. That's good news. That God gives us the option to choose Him, to choose His ways. Despite how we feel or the way it looks, it looks like there's less, God. It it looks like it takes away from my family. It looks like it takes away from my money. It looks like it takes away. Ask for the godly way. and Take that path and you'll find rest in your soul. That means, listen, once you commit, you'll, you'll start to see, man, there's a calmness in your soul. You'll know that you did what God's called you to do. It's an awesome set of scripture there.